So we begin this new series today, The Grind, persevering through a tough world. Man, is this world tough or what? Yeah? yeah? Get some amens on that one, right? So, so during this series, hopefully we're going to detail the importance of, even as we go through our daily life, the grind of life, how, how we should be able to persevere, how we can grow in our relationship with Christ during it all. And what we're going to do is we're going to be examining the, the life of the Apostle Paul. And, and as you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, he definitely had to persevere through suffering. He had a tough life, but he was called by God to actually live and deal with this tough life. And, and it's something we'll be looking at today as we dig into his word. And we're going to look at the actual conversion of Paul or actually the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who would eventually become the Apostle Paul. So if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to open it up to Acts chapter 9. We're going to be in verses 1 through 19. And, and just something for us to think about as we go through this today is that us, that every believer, every single believer is called to share in Christ's suffering. We're called to share in the suffering of Christ each and every day, and we need to be ready for that. We need to be ready because at some point we are going to suffer in this life. And sometimes I think we forget it. So if you have your Bible, again, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. If you don't have a Bible with you, there is one in the back of the pew. But as a reminder, it will always be up here on the screen. And if you joined us online for online church, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Um, but like I always say, don't let watching on, or joining online be a replacement of you being connected to a local church. You know, each of us should be connected to a local body of Christ where we can work on our relationship with Jesus and with others. And, and it doesn't have to be this church. Just make sure you get connected to a church someplace where you can work on that relationship with Jesus. And because that's what we're called to do. We're called to be Christ followers. We're called to continue to meet together. And as I've said, there are some people who join us online. There's no way they can connect with us here because they're not in South Florida. So make sure you get connected. As much as we appreciate and we love you, as a matter of fact, let's give it up for those who joined us for church online. We appreciate you guys very much. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dig into God's word. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Now Saul was still breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest, then requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul... Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight, the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on, our, on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. 
I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias went and entered the house. He placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. And after that, taking some food, he, re uh, he regained his strength. Saul was with his disciples in Damascus for some time. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we dig into your word today, Lord, we ask that you open up our eyes so that we can see what it is you want us to see. Lord, open our ears that we may hear your voice. And Lord, may you be glorified through it all as we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see Saul was radically changed. He, he, he was radically saved and then he was transformed. And he was gone from being a Jesus hater and persecuting people of the way, persecuting Christians to becoming this faithful, courageous Jesus follower that would later be named Paul. So he went from one extreme to the other. And you see, each of us has a conversion story. Each one of us has one from one time or another. And I've said it before, as a child, I had a drug problem. I got drugged to church every time the doors were open. You know, because my mom, if them church doors were open, I was, I was going. And I was raised Catholic, you know, so now think of that theology from being raised Catholic to being a Southern Baptist preacher. There's a theology lesson for you. But ultimately, what, what happened is that I grew up in a Catholic church. I was an altar boy. I actually had visions and thoughts of becoming a Catholic priest. And then adolescence came along and I was like, oh no, I can't do this. So I decided to move on from there. But, but as a, that, that's a whole different sermon right there. But the one thing that being raised in church taught me is I knew who Jesus was. I knew who Jesus was and I had foundations for a faith that I just didn't know what it really was. You know, I knew with these rules, I, I knew I was supposed to do this or I was supposed to do this, you know, and I had to kneel twice, stand up three times in church. And, you know, I, I knew the routine. I knew what I had to do, but I didn't have a relationship. I didn't have that relationship with Jesus until I was 18 years old and I was in the military. And it's kind of ironic. People are like, you actually accepted Jesus while you were in the Marine Corps. Yes. Yes, I did. In a small country church uh, is where I can truly say I met Jesus. And the unfortunate thing is, you know, here I'm 18 years old. Now I've gone up and I profess my faith in Jesus. And then I got baptized in a creek. And I'm supposed to be all right. Hey, I'm, I'm this Jesus. I'm going to have it all together. But that's not how life was. I was in the military. You know what you do in the military at 4.30 in the afternoon? You hit the bars. You get off base and you hit the bars and you're in the bars till 4 o'clock in the morning. Then you get done at 4 in the morning. You stagger back to the barracks. You get an hour of sleep. You get up and you got to go run three miles. And you swear all day long, I'm never going to do this again. And 4.30 hits and what do you do? You change your clothes and you're back in the bars. So I was still living this life even though I had professed my faith in Jesus Christ. And so I basically had this one foot in the world and I was still doing everything I was doing. But then the other part of me when I was alone and I was digging in and reading God's word, I was getting convicted of the things I was doing. And then when I was in church and with my Christian friends, I was living this different life. So I had like this double life going on. And I think we all get caught up like that from time to time. You know, I had raised my white flag. I waved, waved my right flag of, I surrendered to you, Jesus. I had done that. But the problem was there were times when that white flag, instead of being up here, was about right here. And to be quite honest, there's times I kept it in my pocket. 
because I didn't want people to see it. I didn't want to get picked on for, oh, look at this. He's a Jesus follower. He's a Jesus freak. You got to remember, I did this back in the 80s. So back in the 80s, it would have been, oh, you're one of them Jesus people, huh? You're one of them, oh, Bible thumpers, you know? So, so I had to live this life. And, and even today, you know, there's still times, hey, you know, my banner is high. But there's times that I lower that white flag of surrender. There, there's times when things get tough. There, there's times when it's just having a bad day and, and the pressures of this world, you know, that, that, that banner of I surrender comes down a little bit. You know, the day I lost my mom, that banner came down some because it was rough and I started having to ask them questions again. And I started saying, wait a minute, Lord, I'm following you. Why do I have all this pain? Lord, why didn't you answer my prayer? Why, why, why? And, and I got to asking these questions. And there's times in life when it gets rough and you start asking these questions and you got to, I surrender to you, Lord. Maybe not as much today. But them are the days that we're supposed to persevere. Them are the days that we're supposed to really dig in and look for it. But I'm just like you. I'm human and I question, God, why? Why'd you take my mom? God, why'd you do this in my life? I'm stronger because of them days, but we still go through it. You know, thank God we're able to pick up God's word and dig into it each and every day. That we're able to pull up sermons or devotions online. We've got all of these resources that we can go to to help us when we're down. And, and you, you even think about when you look through the Bible and, and I think about how messed up my life was. Even when I first accepted Christ and I was doing things wrong. But then I look at the Bible. Saul, the, who becomes the Apostle Paul, he was persecuting Christians. He was literally on the road to Damascus to go persecute people who were following Jesus. And Jesus met him right where he was at. Radically changed his life. Then you even look at the patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Even the life of Moses. They were messed up too. David, a man after God's own heart, was messed up. Man, I am in good company. It's good to know that we're not the only ones who are messing up, right? When we can look in God's word and see people who are more messed up than us, I'm like, yeah, all right. I know I ain't that bad. Definitely ain't that bad. I'm close, but I ain't that bad. You know, we're in, we're in good company. But friction happens. Friction happens in this world. Unfortunately, when we get that friction, we start to doubt. And we start to question that relationship with God. And we really start to question, where is our white flag of surrender? Maybe it's down elbow height right now. We all, we all get them questions. And, and I think a lot of times that we just become entitled. I'm a Christian. I read these promises in God's word. I'm entitled to rainbows and unicorns and puppies. But that's not what the word says. That's not what God's word says. And, and you think about, you know, through the years, each generation, every generation says the generation after them is worse. You know, and, and one of the ones that gets the worst rap right now is millennials. Millennials, anyone born from 1982 to 2002? I'm not picking, brother. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not picking. <laughs> But millennials, they're actually called Generation Me, you know, because it's all about me. And they even got T-shirts, you know, I like me and me likes me kind of thing. But, but they get this bad rap of wanting everything given to them. But it's interesting because I guarantee if you talk to my brother AJ back there and even talking with my own kids, they're like, Dad. Man, that next generation's worse than us. Dad, you know them young people today are worse than we are. They're worse than we are. They grew up and they don't know what not having the internet is like. 
They don't know what an Encyclopedia Britannica is. They just search Google for everything. You know, they got this entitlement that we want everything. It should be given to us because we deserve it. And unfortunately, what we do is, is as Christians, we look, go back and we kind of, well, I've accepted Jesus, so I'm entitled. So that entitlement isn't just about generations. That entitlement, sometimes we fall into ourselves. We get stuck on feeling like we deserve something. And it doesn't matter what age you are. Because I guarantee everyone in this room feels entitled about something. Every one of us. I know I do. And, and unless I'm alone here, and if I'm alone, I'm sorry, I'm just, I guess I'm having a bad day. But no. <laughs> I feel entitled today. Not really. Every generation gets a little worse. Today's society, everything is right now. You look at the news. We want this much minimum wage. We want this health care. We want our college debt paid for. <clears throat> That's great. But I got a question. If we're going to pay for your college debt and I already paid for my college, do I get my money back? Just a question because if you get it, I should get it too, right? You know, minimum wage, $15 an hour, $2,400 a month. What do you make on Social Security? Shouldn't it be the same? But people don't think about that. So, so you get this entitlement, but then if uh, all of a sudden someone speaks up like that, well, what about, well, oh, whoa, whoa, you, you can't speak against that. The culture is going to dictate that. No, this is for me, 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 not you, 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 you. But we do the same thing. As Christ followers, we should do the same thing. And as Christians, we shouldn't. We should be different than the culture. But we get caught up as soon as bad times happen. And trust me, bad times come. It, it, it happens. And I think it's interesting, verse 16, Jesus says this about Saul. I will show him now how much suffering for my, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Welcome to Christianity. Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and basically saying, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. That's a welcome, isn't it? How would you like to be welcomed like that? You've accepted Jesus Christ, now I'm going to show you how much you got to suffer. But basically we're called to suffer. We're told that you know, the apostle Paul saw who became Paul. We know he did suffer. Think about this. In, this. in the scripture today, he was blinded for three days. He was blinded. He didn't eat or drink for three days. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, he actually tells us this. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. And he goes on in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9 to say, Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. 13 of the 27 books in the Old Testament he wrote. So he's written almost half of the Old Testament, uh, almost half of the New Testament, was written by the Apostle Paul, who we see went through this suffering. Four of the books in the, in the New Testament that he wrote, he wrote while he was in prison. Wrote them while he was in prison. The book of Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and the letter to Philemon. Now think about that. In prison and anyone who's spent any time in church, and if you haven't, I encourage you, read Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians. And when they talk about joy, and when they talk about love, especially loving your enemy, he's in jail while writing these. He's in jail while writing these. He suffered all of this, being shipwrecked, being beaten, 
all these different things and continue to walk for Christ. He persevered through his suffering for Jesus Christ. The same Paul, the same Saul, who was there for the stoning of Stephen, he saw the stoning, went, got papers so that he could chase down the people of the way. The Apostle Paul actually caused Christianity to move beyond Jerusalem because they had to flee. They flee persecution, so they left, and he continued to chase them. So not only did he help expand Christianity through persecution, after Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, he continued the move of Christianity throughout the world. He never stopped doing what Jesus called him to do. You know, and unfortunately, we all sometimes feel entitled and think we don't have to persevere, but we're going to have this daily grind. We're going to have this daily grind in our lives. And see, sometimes I think people make decisions to follow Jesus as their get out of jail free card. Well, hey, if I, if I accept Jesus, then I get to go to heaven. And they never count the cost of having to persevere through suffering. They never count the cost of what it's going to mean to follow Jesus. And Jesus even says in his word that as followers on earth, we're going to have hard times. John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous because I have conquered the world. And in fact, he said that denying ourselves, we need to take up our cross daily. So in Matthew 16, 24, he actually says, then Jesus said to the disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And often this looks like being faithful in the grind. We're in the grind each and every day, being faithful through this grind. You know, that regular, unglamorous part of following Jesus. Because sometimes it's just regular. It's unglamorous. There's nothing special about it. You think about how we have to treat people who hurt us. How do we have to love our enemies? How we have to show mercy and forgiveness to others. There's no glamour in that. But yet that's what we got to do. So we need to really ask ourselves that question. How do you treat the people who hurt you? Seriously, how do you treat people who hurt you? Most of us probably don't do it like Jesus. How do you treat the people who hurt you? How do you give compassion and mercy and grace to someone who is purposely trying to hurt you? Because we're called to. I think the real snapshot is that what we do in life when no one's looking. When, when no one's looking, you know, when, when no one's around, what are the words that you're saying? Well, what's coming out of your mouth when no one's there? And think about it as young adults. Man, there's all kinds of stuff that comes out of our mouth at school when mom and dad ain't around. But if we're Christ followers, we should be an example. What comes out of our mouth when we're at work? Well, when we're not in church, we're not with someone else. What are we watching? What kind of shows are you watching on TV? What are you looking at on the internet, on your phone? What are you doing and what are you thinking? See, these are true measurements of where you're at. You know, just coming to church on a Sunday morning, shaking hands, give fist bump, high fives. You know, we generally put on our best when we come to church, right? So it's not the real us. It's generally not the real us when we come to church. It's the facade that we put on. Now, some people are the same in church as they are during the week. But a lot of us live a totally different life. Like I said to begin, I accepted Jesus and I had one foot in the world and one foot for Jesus. And when I was with my friends, 
I did that stuff. When I was with my Christian friends, I did this stuff. And as a Christ follower and as we're walking, sometimes we need to change our friends. Because sometimes we get so caught up with, hey, these are the people I always went drinking with or I always did this with and I did this with. And now you've accepted Jesus and it's time for you to change. Sometimes you got to put them friends away. Now, it don't mean you can't circle back somewhere down the line once you got your addiction or whatever it was you were doing under control that you can't circle back around and let them see your life transformed. But trying to transform your life hanging out with the same people is going to be kind of hard, especially if they're doing nothing but what the world says. And we've all been caught up in that one time or another. People who accept Jesus Christ and fall right back into the things they were doing. That's why they have recovery groups that are Christian recovery groups. Because guess what? We fail. We have to persevere each and every day. That's why you have things like Celebrate Recovery and Divorce Care. To help people who are going through real life. Because real life happens. Just because you accept Jesus don't mean you're going to be perfect. We will never be perfect. We can strive to be excellent and we can actually reach a point of excellence, but we will never be perfect. And some of us just keep failing and we're failing on that persevering through our faith. You know, life's hard. There's times on Sunday mornings I get up and I just want to sit on my couch keeping my pajamas on, eating a bowl of cereal, joining my brothers and sisters' church online. And then Patty reminds me I got to come and preach. I'm like, oh, really? I have to? But there's days I'd just rather stay home. Man, I just don't feel it this Sunday. I've had a bad week. Jesus, I surrender, but I'm kind of right here. I'm kind of not feeling it today. And we're going to have days like that. We're going to have days like that. We need to continue to move and persevere through our faith. Look around you. Look around at the people in your church. Look around your job, family, friends. Each one of us know people who are suffering worse than us. Each one of us knows someone who's going through something bad in their life. And if you don't believe it, just look at the prayer list. Just look at the prayer list that we send out Monday through Thursday. There are people in the church who are suffering physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, emotionally stuck with hurts, hangups, habits. And we as Christ followers need to be able to persevere and join them in that suffering. Pick up the phone. Hey, how can I pray for you? Hey, is there something I can do for you? Because when you think about this, when you're out there trying to help somebody else, what suffering you may be going through, actually doesn't seem as bad. And as a body, we're supposed to come together and help each other. We're supposed to be there for each other. So think about who you may have to pick up the phone and call or text this week and join them in their suffering. Even the apostle Paul, he was blinded. What did he need? He needed his friends to help him go and find a place. He needed Judas to open up his house for him to stay there. And he needed a Christian, a Christ follower, to come and pray for him to be healed. We need to be praying for people to be healed. We need to be praying for brothers and sisters who are going through a rough time to be healed of their suffering. We're going to go through it. We're going to have suffering. It's part of our life's journey. It's part of the call Jesus has in our life. But we need to go through it to become stronger and better than who we are today. I remember reading a story 
about shipbuilders, and it was back, you know, in the early days when everything had sails. And what they said is that the builders would go into the forest and they'd find a tree. And, hey, this is a perfect tree. It's nice and straight. And what they would do is clear the land around it and get rid of all the trees that were around it. So what would happen is this tree would be exposed to the winds and the storms and the weather. And over time, as it continued to grow, it grew that much stronger because of its exposure to the elements. And that way it would be strong enough so that when they went and they cut that tree down and they made that mass to hold them giant sails, it would hold the sail through the storms it would find in the oceans. We need to do the same thing. And I believe that if we build our lives on that rock of Jesus, we can do the same thing and become that, that mass that's strong enough to survive in the storms and to continue moving forward. In, in Romans 8, 31 through 39, and, and my Bible has got a heading and it says, the believer's triumph. In Romans 8, 31 through 39 actually says this. But what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are conquerors. We will have to persevere through this tough world. Every believer is going to have to suffer for Christ. It's part of our calling. It is part of our calling. Just like the Saul of Tarsus who becomes Paul the Apostle. He suffered. And over the next weeks, we're going to dig more into his suffering and how he persevered. So in our lives, we can look to persevere also. So that as we go through this grind... The grime, whether it's in school, whether it's at work, or for most of us in our family, that we're going to be able to persevere through it and that we will be that shining light for Jesus Christ in everything we do. We're called to persevere. And maybe you're sitting here and saying, well, pastor, I, I understand this perseverance stuff, but I need Jesus. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you're waiting to get it right and thinking, hey, I need to get perfect first, look where he met Saul of Tarsus. He was on his way to persecute Christians. You're never going to be perfect. We all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Every one of us sin and fall short. But thankfully, God's word says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Praise God for that. Praise God for his love and his mercy that he's going to show us in his life. But we still have to persevere. We've got to walk the walk that's laid before us. And unfortunately, as we walk this path that God lays before us, we got this thing called free will. And sometimes we get off that path. And sometimes we may take a wrong turn here or there. 
but he's always going to be there. His arm is always going to be long enough to stretch out and grab us and pull us back in and give us that hug that we need. That hug that we need to be able to persevere in the grind in this tough world. The world's a tough place. We know we deal with it every day. Some of us more than others. And maybe you're sitting there and you're struggling and saying, you know, pastor, my white flag of surrender ain't here. It is down here. Maybe you just need to come up and come up to the altar and ask God for that strength. That strength to be able to continue to walk forward and, and walk in the path that he had, even though you feel like you failed. Or maybe you're really living that double life. You're this way when you come to church, high five and fist bumping everyone. Way to go, brother and sisters in Christ. But then you're out in the parking lot and you're immediately on your phone looking at something you shouldn't be looking at. Or you're heading down to leaving church and heading to the bar to get your drink on. Living a different life, that one foot in the world and one foot for Jesus. Be all in. Be all in. And you can even say, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing here. But if you're with me, I'm all in. Because I've said it from the very beginning that I started here. Lord, I don't know what I'm doing here. But if you'll show me I'm all in. That's what we're called to do. Be all in as we take this walk with him through this tough world, through the grind. So if you just need to come up here during this final song, you can come up here, pray, leave it at the altar. If you need to accept Jesus or know Jesus, I'll be off to the side. You can come see me. If you just need prayer, come on up. We're here for you. So Heavenly Father, I lift up this congregation to you, Lord. Lord, I lift them up to you that they will understand that we've got to persevere. We're going to have tough times in this life, but we just need to continue to seek you through them. Lord, we, we dig through your word and we can see the suffering that people have gone through but their eyes have always been kept on you. And Lord, may we do that. May we focus our focus be on you and the things that you call us to do. So that as we go through this grind of life, as, as we deal with all of these struggles, that we'll be fixed on you and continue to walk the path you call us to walk. And Lord, I don't know who it is. Someone in here is, is suffering, dealing with that double life, Lord. Lord, I ask you to have them make that move and come up here, Lord. That they will come up here and leave it at this altar for you. That they will seek you and put away and say, I'm all in, Lord. I'm raising my flag above my head. I'm tired of it being in my pocket or at elbow level. And Lord, if there's someone here who don't know you, I ask you to make them make that move, Lord. That they'll come up and join your family today. And that they will accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. And Lord, we love you, we honor you, we praise you. And we make this prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.